Hey everybody, Adam from Robo Rock and Gem. Today we're going to talk all about drilling gemstones. Same thing applies to uh, sea glass, shells, and this is for the novice as well as the expert because we're going to talk about how to drill carvings, how to drill tumble stones, rough stones. Uh, I'll talk about 0.5 millimeter drill holes all the way up to 50 millimeter drill holes if you want to do bangles, everything. So this is your all-encompassing video and it's, uh, it's supposed to be the, the main one that'll teach you everything you need to know. So first, let's start with my drilling rig setup. So I use drill presses, right? Uh, a lot of people will show you um, like Dremel stands or stands for your Fordham. Those are going to cost you uh, about 70 bucks Canadian, $50 US, somewhere in there for a brand new one. And they're, they're all plastic. There's not a metal part on them except for maybe a couple screws, which means they're flimsy. There's just, uh, there's not a lot there to hold them. Whereas a drill press, you see this is all metal, it's a big solid post. So uh, these cost about 200 bucks brand new, Canadian, again, you're looking at maybe 150, 160 bucks US. Um, however, on Craigslist, I can find them all day long for 60 bucks, again, $40 US. Uh, if, you, if you're getting a, my math here, $40, if you wanna wait a month, you can find one for about 40 bucks on Craigslist, right? Use, they're pretty simple machines. You got a motor in the back running a pulley that spins your uh, your drill bit down here, your Jacob's chuck. And the beauty about these, you know, for again, the 40 or 60 bucks, whatever you want to spend on it, and it's a solid one. You know, every one I bought off Craigslist, uh, it's always run, you can check it first. But like I said, it's simple. There's not a lot of little parts that can go wrong on them. So it's a good, it's a good buy for a used machine. Um, so I'd highly recommend these. Mostly because the motor in the back, you see the size of that motor back there? It's way bigger than a Dremel. A Dremel, you got a little dinky motor in the handpiece. Plus, I would avoid Dremels for anything lapidary related, right? Like, uh, partly because you're holding the motor, you're holding electricity in your hand while you're working underwater, right? It's just not smart to begin with. Plus, all that vibration, if you want to do a long uh, stint to work, two hours or more, uh, your hand's going to start to hurt because you're literally holding onto a motor. That's a lot of vibration going into your knuckles. Um, also, the main reason though would be the Jacob's chuck versus the collets. Dremels have collets, which means it's a sleeve, so every time you want to switch the bit, you have to take the whole front end apart and change the bit. It's, uh, it definitely reduces your workflow, whereas the Jacob's chuck is the one with the key here, and it just it increases your workflow. It's so much faster, you can put any size bit in there, there's no sleeves. Um, and Fordhams have the same thing. If you're going to carve gemstone, I'd recommend a Fordham. We'll get into that for our next video on carving. Um, as far as it goes, so I got I got my drill press, right? Again, you're, you're not into it for the money very much. I use a baking sheet. Same thing you'd find at the at thrift store. So this is like a brownie tray. Uh, one thing I would avoid is the bottom of mine. We'll go quiet here. The bottom is a bit bowed, that means when I drill things, sometimes the bottom flexes out on me and that uh, causes a variable in my workpiece and it can sink the stone and sometimes snap a bit while it's inside. Um, I'm used to it, so I keep drilling on it, but when you buy one, buy one with a nice solid bottom. Uh, but a brownie sheet, you basically need a tray, right? And then as you drill, you're going to want something to uh, prevent the drill bit from going down into the tray because we don't want our water spilling out the bottom. So I like to use standard acrylic plastic. Uh, there's a plastic supplier out by the metal scrap yard I go to. So whenever I'm picking up scrap copper, I just go through their scrap bins and I find all kinds of off cuts. Uh, they don't have to be too thick because the diamond bits aren't going to pierce this very fast. Um, and you'll always know the moment you pierce a stone, you'll always know. It's kind of like an orgasm when you get there, you know. Uh, so you can get any size plastic piece, big ones, chop them down, they work really well on uh, like a jigsaw, scroll saw, you can cut them up really easy, they tool basically very easily. Um, so it stacks more down here, but again the scraps are free or you can just buy a, buy a small sheet of acrylic for what might cost you 10 bucks. I wouldn't recommend wood, it has its uses for projects, um, but it's not my favorite because Again, here's, a, here's just a wood scrap, right, that I use. The reason I don't like wood is when it's soggy underwater, which is how we have to drill, um, it starts to bow, it starts to get soft, and your support under your stone starts to uh, lose its rigidity, right? Um, you need a lot of support under that stone to help keep the back from popping out. Um, so 
when this gets soggy, you lose that. However, uh, wood works. It does work. Um, so it is an option, but not the preferred one. Next up, a uh, uh, quick tip is when you buy your drill press, whether it's new or used, make sure the Jacob's chuck goes as small as possible. That means when you tighten it, um, you're going to have three prongs that cinch like a miniature vise, and they're going to hold your drill bit. Some of them only go to about a millimeter size. So this one that I got, the smallest bit it will hold is about 1.1 uh, millimeter because there's a little void in there, negative space, a gap, that the vise won't cinch. So uh, this one, however, can hold a, like a pin, basically, which are, when you get into the 0.5 millimeter drill bits, you've got a pin, literally it's been electroplated in diamond. So this one can hold any size bit from small up to about quarter inch. And when I say quarter inch, that's like uh, probably about six millimeters or something. So most of the shafts on a bigger drill bit are going to be standard size, about a quarter inch, maybe bigger. Um, and then the diamond just expands out. So as I now start talking about drill bits, let's get into that portion of the video. So as far as drill bits go, um, I think the biggest thing people are confused with at the start is what's the difference between a burr and a drill bit. Uh, there are noticeable differences and they each have different jobs. Do not drill with a burr. That's a big thing. Um, don't carve with a drill bit. So as I get into the differences, um, it's going to seem complex. So let me start with burrs. Burrs come in all shapes and sizes. You can usually go online and find a sheet. Any, any supplier for diamond burrs um, will have a shape sheet. So you've got flames, you've got barrel, you've got uh, inverted cones, you have um, ball burrs, all kinds. Um, there's metal versions which look like little paddles all along. We sometimes call them paddle burrs, right? Um, but anything we use to work stone is diamond... Uh, uh, diamond encrusted, so there, so it's electroplated essentially. Do not use brazed. There's brazed diamond bits. Those are for bigger industrial uses. Um, so you're going to ignore those. That's where the diamonds look really stuck out on there, like like big diamond chunks, and the the bits are just way too rough. Whether you're carving or drilling anything in stone, don't use them unless you're doing sculpture size stuff. Uh, so for finer, again, jewelry scale things or even just high-end carvings, we're going to get into finer particles. When we talk about burrs, again, burrs are for carving. They'll look almost the same, um, especially when you get a cylinder burr, right? So that's basically just a, a cone or, yeah, a cone, right? So a solid, a solid round uh, tube. The diamonds on burrs are smaller. so. D diamond burrs come in any size, right? You can get the diamonds at like 60 grit, 80 grit, you can get 46 grit, which is very big for a diamond particle on what we work with. Mostly if you buy a standard burr set online or from a store, it's going to be about a 220 grit. So as you start to understand the size of diamond particles just by eye, um, you'll get to know the difference immediately when you see them. Uh, it can become confusing when you see the, uh, the solid uh, cylinder burrs that have bigger diamond particles. Those are the toughest ones that are, are easy to confuse because when we talk about drill bits, we're moving back over to drill bits now, drill bits will always have uh, bigger diamond particles because you're doing a rough action, right? You're doing a lot of stock removal. Um, sometimes there are core bits, right? So anything, anything, again, still talking, now we're on drill bits, anything over two millimeters will start turning into a core bit. Another word for it is hole saw. That's, they're both the same, they're talking about the same thing. Hole saws, core bits, drill bits. The reason for that um, is because you've got all that uh, abrasive action and rather than trying to braid through all that stone, you basically cut, uh, cut a hole out and you take the, the center chunk out. So, um, there's various things about those, but anything anything over two millimeters is always going to be a tube uh, style bit. So it's only the ones, the only ones you'll confuse with uh, burrs are the ones under two millimeters, right? Um, so 
let me tackle the confusing part again, um, just to help. Burrs will usually have a very thick shaft, right? You're meant to do a lot of side grinding on them. So whatever thing you're using for carving, let's say, let's, Mike, if you want to walk with me, I'll show you what a Fordham looks like. So when I carve, uh, I use something like this, right? A flex shaft with a hand piece, right? I have a motor. You with me, Mike? All right, so we got a motor over here and uh, the motor spins a coil inside this shaft and it spins, you know, I got some bearings in here that stabilize it. So this is again a Jacob's truck, but what I put in here are diamond burrs. So let's see if I have some sticking around here, right here. And the, the beauty of these is I'm meant to be side, uh, putting a lot of weight when I grind, let's say I got a stone like this one. If I'm gonna grind, I'm usually putting a lot of side pressure, which often means the shaft is gonna be thick right? Because it, you want as much stability so the bit doesn't bend as possible. When we go back over and look at drill bits, small drill bits, sometimes those shafts are narrower because if you're drilling a hole, you have to pierce deeper than the drill bits uh, abrasive part. So you need your shaft to sometimes be thinner. Let's say you have a, a one millimeter bit, then your, your shaft in behind it is gonna have to be like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, something like that, so that it can keep following in behind. That's not always the case. Um, but I just wanted to show you what burrs look like. To show you a cylinder burr, to give you an example, again, anything, like I said, uh, burrs are always gonna be solid. So this is a cylinder burr, you got a thick shaft on it, but the head is solid, it's not hollow, right? Drill bits are always going to be hollow, especially the ones you buy. Um, so that's a big distinguishment. Um, burrs are never going to be hollow in any way, like those tubes. Oh yeah. Uh, one other thing I should mention about drill bits, there's sintered versus electroplated. I also mentioned brazed. You want to stay away from brazed, brazed bits. Um, electroplated, still good. Okay. So electroplated means that the diamond particles have been plated onto the surface. Um, sometimes they're using nickel to do that. Um, but essentially, if you strip your bit, all the diamond is gone. There's no more. Whereas, and those those kinds of bits can cost anywhere from ten cents to ten dollars, depending on whether it's made in China or USA. Um, how much diamond is in there, how true, meaning how perfectly machined those bits are. Um, uh, you, you can spend $60 on a plated bit realistically when you get into the bigger ones if you want to, but uh, you do not have to. And I would never recommend spending lots of money on bits, I'll get into that later. The other kind of bits uh, sintered are where the diamond is mushed into the metal. So. Uh, during liquefaction point of the metal, they literally fold the diamonds over on themselves inside the, or sorry, fold the metal over on itself and smush the diamonds in. So sintered, um, as you wear down the bit, you expose more diamond. Um, this is common throughout all lapidary tools from grinding wheels on arbors to carving burrs, uh, as well as drills. Do not get it for drill bits. Just with drill bits, buy the cheapest ones you can find. Um, Reason being is you're prone to breaking them. Those cores will get plugged inside. Um, again, these two bits, as you start drilling, if you drill too many cores, you get three of them stacked inside from three different rocks and they're jammed in there. You can't get it out and you've created a blockade, a stopping point, and all of a sudden you can't drill anywhere past that depth. So if you spend 60 bucks on a bit and jam it up, you, you may have a lot of life left in the diamonds, but the bit is worthless, right? You could try and put it in a vise and drill into it, but just buy cheap bits and you don't have to deal with the headache, right? Um, if you want to buy bits, I sell them on my website. The link is below and I have way better descriptions on them than you're going to find anywhere else. I'll tell you what they're best used for. Uh, as far as drill bits go, so now we've differentiated between burrs and drill bits. Hopefully you know now you're going for things that are, if you're buying drill bits, you're going for those tube bits. Um, and when you buy a tube bit, always buy one that's hollow all the way through um, so that you can see light on the other side. There are different styles which have a solid post, a solid shaft in the back, but hollow in the inside. Those suck. 
basically. So for me, when I get cores in there, what I do is I take a welding rod and I bang all the flux off. You can go to Canadian Tire anywhere, buy a, a chunk of, or sorry, a pack of welding rods. You may know a buddy that just has one laying around. But I can go in from the back end here and I can jam out the cores, right? Sometimes I need to do it on a table, whatever. But the beauty of, uh, of having an open back end is I can relieve and release anything that jams in there. And so uh, even with these small ones, this is a five or a four millimeter bit I've got right here and I can still fit a welding rod into it, right? So I can prolong the, the life of my bit through that uh, technique. Um, if you get the solid post ones, even if they're cheap, you still face the same problem with those cores binding inside. Um, another issue with, let's see, you get those cores binding inside, it'll create a very minimal bulge in the metal. Not a lot, and it's, it's, it's very small, but as you jam that in there, it will force uh, kind of like an onion shape in the metal, and as you're trying to drill, what you're going to end up doing is breaking your stone because you're trying to put a wedge in the drill hole. Um, so just as much as possible, um, never even buy the ones with solid posts that are, that are over two millimeters. Uh, sintered, electroplated, uh, cordless. Okay, so let's get into uh, higher end bits, right? Um, there's ultra thins and there's deep drill, drill bits. Um, ultra thin bits. So let's say they're standard bits, right? You got your standard bits. So I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about these core ones for right now. So the core bits, you got a, looks like maybe one millimeter is the metal diameter and it's all plated with diamond. When you get into ultra thin, they're usually twice the price, but they are worth it. So uh, as I mentioned before, drill bits, you're meant to hog out a lot of material. It's a rough uh, stone working process. So you get ultra thins and the metal is thinner. Um, that, that is part of your hole saw, right? Because you just got a, what any lapidary tool is just a, a chunk of metal plated with diamond, realistically. So you can create any kind of surface. You can get custom burrs made. I've had custom wheel shapes made because all it is is just a machine piece of metal that you put diamonds over, right? So they get with the ultra thin bits, very thin, and the diamonds are usually a finer particle. So Whereas drill bits might normally be uh, 120 grit or uh, you know 100 grit, um, maybe even 80 grit sometimes somewhere in there, your ultra thins are going to be about a 220 grit, um, and those are exceptionally, uh, especially good for polished stone. So if you've got something that has already been polished, you want to use an ultra thin because it will prevent chipping. Right? It's less crude. It's less of a blunt instrument, so when you start honing into your uh, stone, it's not going to create little micro flakes around the surface, whereas the standard bits will, because it's a crude tool going if you're going into a finished product. Um, the other thing, and, and also too, ultra thins are great for when you start getting to inlay work and higher end work. Your kerf, meaning the material loss in stone, is different. So. Um, again, the cheap plated bits from China that cost, you know, 10 cents each or somewhere in there. Um, your kerf is, has more variables to it because the diamonds will differ in size. Whereas the ultra thins, so, uh, if you get a five millimeter ultra thin bit, your kerf might be uh, plus minus of 0.1 millimeter, whereas the standard bits might be plus minus of 0.3. So if you're trying to do fine inlay, um, Sometimes those ultra thins can come in handy just for uh, being precise. The next kind of special bit I want to talk about is a deep drill bit. I drilled about a thousand holes in stone before I realized that deep drills um, will say would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of stones. I don't really care about the drill bit cost, but it's a stone. So deep drill bits look like uh, two Siamese bits. You got one post that splits into two. And uh, if you were to look, if I was to look dead down the end of it, it would look like a figure eight kind of uh, infinity symbol. The, I've only ever seen them go up to about 2.3 millimeter for a deep drill. So now this is for smaller holes. Let's say you've got a crystal you want to drill, right? Crystals are usually pretty thick. Um, so an ultra or a deep drill bit is meant to pierce a uh, distance longer than a standard slab. With, so if it's uh, Deeper than about point or deeper than five millimeters, deeper than six millimeters, right? Standard slab width, 
you know, four millimeters, you want to use a deep drill. And we'll get into that later as we drill and, and the reasons why. Um, or I could just get into it now. Essentially, as you drill with a, a standard drill bit, some of them are tapered, right? So like this one, I have a, a long so a solid shaft and then it, it tapers into my drill bit. So um, as I come down here, I can't pass about that point. I only get five, maybe this one's got about seven millimeters depth to it, but the drill bit starts to wedge and expand. And again, if you're to imagine, the rock doesn't want to go anymore, anywhere. There's no give in it. So if you try and jam a wedge in there, it just splits the stone. That's one reason why stones will break. So um, when I use a deep drill, let me find one here. Um, deep drills have a shaft and it goes up into a wider area at the top. So if I was to drill with this drill, let me flip it over for you. If I was to drill, the shaft can follow in behind and I can go as deep as I want. But these channels in here, in between the, the Siamese bits, allow water to get in and lubricate and cool um, the bit area. So one reason why drill bits will get ruined um, is if you strip the diamond, that, that happens if the diamond has too much friction and gets caught up and the diamond doesn't want to spin but the shaft does. Another reason is heat. Heat buildup will break down the bonds that have electroplated the diamond. Um, the other reason, uh, yeah, so I mean, those are your two basic reasons. Uh, coolant, right, which will help with the heat. Water is what we're gonna drill under. Or, and water also acts as our lubricant, which will help the drill bit spin, the diamond spin in that bit. Um, you do not ever have to drill under oil. Never ever drill with oil. It's gross on your fingers. It's if it splashes, it's horrible to clean up. It'll um, change the color of your stone slightly. So always use water and use warm water, right? Be nice to yourself, um, and don't uh, don't make yourself work under cold water. So looks like now we're moving on to how to drill rock. So let's get into that. So as far as drilling goes, uh, hot water is good. We're going to take our baking sheet and we're going to fill it with some hot water here. Don't go full, right? You really, you only need to have enough water to uh, pass maybe a millimeter, to, sorry, let's say three millimeters above your stone. Two, three millimeters in there is the optimal spot. Uh, anything above that, you're just creating a splash zone because if your bit goes in too deep or your chuck hits the water, it's going to start spraying water everywhere. If you don't have enough water, you're not going to create the cooling and lubricating that action that you need. So we'll take uh, one of my plastic sheets here, acrylic sheets. You have to be aware as you start coring into your sheet a bunch, you're going to create uh, an uneven surface, whether that's on the top or the bottom, right? If I put it on the bottom, my plastic piece is going to start rocking back and forth underneath. So I create an instable platform or an unstable one. Uh, same thing if I've got uh, knobs and everything, uneven surface, rough surface on the top, and I put a stone slab on there to drill. Um, it's going to bounce around a bunch because there's something underneath. And I want as solid a support as possible on the bottom. So if you're a lapidary and you're cutting slabs, you might have these little hangers on the end where you're cutting and the stone just drops off rather than cutting all the way through. You're going to want to braid those off uh, if possible to create a solid platform. Um, but you can always just hang them over the edge, which is what I usually do. And then I drill on the side part of the plastic kind of so that it's out of the way. Uh, if you're doing tumbled stones, you always want to drill before you tumble, uh, not after. Um, if, if you drill before, um, it's going to allow the entrance point and the exit point of your stone to get polished throughout the tumbling process. If you do it after, as you drill through the stone, you're going to have something called blowout in the back, create a crater and the luster in that area, the way the light bounces off the surface is going to be different than the rest of the polished stone. And so it will be uh, unesthetic. Um, it's a trade off though. When you put stones in a tumbler that have already been drilled, all the little tiny stone pieces like to get jammed up in the hole. It's not a huge problem. I use little dental picks and I like, you can go to, like I go to Princess 
auto, but in the US you might have Harbor Freight, you can go there and buy a pack of dental picks for seven bucks. Even ask your dentist for some cheap old ones, and you can use those to pull a lot of those little flakes out. Um, so, if you're doing, uh, if you want to drill a cabochon or something for a pendant, like there's uh, pinch bales we often put in. Um, uh, pinch pin bales we call them so you drill a stone and you can put a, a hanger on the top for your rope or your chain to go through and it just clamps on with a um, kind of mechanical tension there and there's two pins that go inside your drilled hole uh, if you're gonna drill a cabochon or anything like that for that reason or anything else rough out your stone but always leave a flat bottom it's very difficult to drill something with a round bottom like a sphere shape or a uh, or even a cab like a domed bottom, it's going to wobble around as you're trying to drill it. It's going to end up sideways, right? Unless you're drilling directly on the center, if you're drilling a side of a cabochon, it's going to want to wobble that way. So usually what I would do is I would rough out the end shapes of my slab and I would leave the top and bottom flat so it sits very evenly. I would drill it and then I would go back and create my domes. Um, If you do have to drill something round, you can modify your wood piece or your acrylic piece and put uh, kind of like a crater in there and that will cradle your stone, right? So uh, a half round kind of, you can take a bigger drill bit um, and kind of create an area you can chisel a part out of wood. Um, sometimes what I've done in this one is I have a, a screw I drilled into there. You can put a couple screws in to create posts almost like a, a fence that you can jam the rock up against and then it won't roll in that direction. You, you'll you wedge it with your finger somewhere in there. So if I take a, a round stone here, sorry I don't have one with me, but I can wedge it up against that screw and I can really stabilize it with my thumb as I drill. Um, these machines are very safe. You can get your hands really close to the abrasive action. Let me just show you that quickly. Um, I'll do it on a big drill bit. Uh, same thing applies to small ones, doesn't matter the size of the drill bit, they're all very safe to use. That being said, don't be a, a dummy with them and just start jamming your fingers all up in moving parts. In here it gets less and less safe, but I'll turn this on. You want to take tracking off? It's off. Okay. So as the drill bit spins, you can put your hand on there, it's not going to hurt you, right? Uh, do not ever do this with a wood bit. Wood bits are twisted and they will catch. Um, never put hair or loose clothing in here. Don't wear jewelry when you do this. But the thing is, again, I can almost try and grab that bit and it will not hurt me. The reason for that is there's just nothing really to catch, right? Um, the abrasive action doesn't work on our skin. Uh, you can abrade your nails if you'd like to, right? Diamond lapidary equipment, think of it as just a nail file moving really fast. Um, as I mentioned before, anything we do with lapidary, whether it's sawing a stone, grinding it to shape on our arbor systems, on our drum wheels, or drilling with drill bits, whether you're using a hole saw, it's all abrasion, 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 right? You're just taking some sort of metal shape, plating it with diamonds, and abrading your way through, right? A saw is just a very thin line abrading. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, the other way is napping, right? Percussion is the only other way to work stone or you drop a stone on the ground, that'll change it. But really abrasion is the, the only, uh, main way lapidary is used. Chemicals can alter soft stones, but that's again, 3% of stones. So, all right. So, uh, this doesn't have to be rocket science. I'm turning it into rocket science. You can pretty much just take a drill bit, put it in a drill press and start drilling if you want. But I want to help, uh, help you become better at drilling to make it so you're not breaking as many stones and wearing out as many drill bits. Um, you can use a hand drill if you want. I've done that before. Sometimes my planter pots at home needed holes in the bottom for drainage. You can drill that uh, ceramic with them too. But for now, let's get small stones as a jasper. Um, whether it's an agate, a calcite, a jasper, a tourmaline, a uh, diamond's going to abrade through all of them. Um, you can sit, you can stand. Uh, so let me change this bit out to a smaller one. 
Um, I usually like to sort my bits, ones I've used versus brand new ones I have in the back here all sorted by size. Um, the smallest bit I've ever seen is 0.5 millimeter. Never use uh, cement bits. These are like concrete bits you'll find. Um, this one's a sintered one. Um, it was cheap centered one, but these are way too coarse for a jewelry piece, even the smaller ones. It's just too much shock, too much vibration, too much stress on the stone, that's going to break the stone, right? Um, so these are uh, never to be used with lapidary grade stone. Um, plastic piece in the bottom. You can use felt pen on a rock when you want to drill, just a standard Sharpie. Um, I like the ultra thin sharpies or ultra what, ultra fine point. Um, it rubs right off if you'd like it to. That you can use acetone to take it off. You can use Goo Gone. Uh, there's many chemical products that will remove felt because felt just doesn't really soak into stone. If you've got a very very soft stone like three or softer on the Mohs hardness scale, the felt might soak in. The only other way it's soaking in is if I draw in there and leave it out in the sun for like 20 years, it'll start to bleach into the rock. But for the most part, I can take that off with uh, some spit and some good old fashioned rubbing. It's pretty much gone there. So this will help you see underwater uh, where you want to drill. Never drill, let's say I'm going to drill the top of this one to make it a pendant stone. Never drill too high up, close to the top because even if you drill it and you pierce the stone without breaking it, you're creating a stone that's very susceptible to uh, snapping later on when a person's wearing it. What I mean by up by the top is by that other black dot there. Let me show you on this uh, camera here. So way up uh, right in here, that'll be a problem dot. The main dot, the lowest one, is where we want to drill. Um, So, as far as drilling goes, you put it in the water, you line it up with your drill press first, make sure you're good to go, and like I said, it's not rocket science, I'll turn the drill press on, and then we'll start abrading through. Um, you want to drill about three quarters of the depth, and don't use the depth gauge or anything like that. What I mean by three quarters is once you've drilled enough stones, maybe ten or more, you'll start to uh, understand where that is. Uh, you want to lay off the drill press a bit and what I mean by that is uh, the force you're taking with the drill press you're basically taking all your might and focusing it in one concentrated point that little one millimeter drill bit I have in here I'm taking all my bicep force right and I'm just channeling it down so the drill press does two things it drills and it presses now if you've got a dull bit the only thing you're doing, the only thing you're doing is pressing and you're just going to press until you snap your stone, right? And so it's a sliding scale. You want to use a nice sharp bit where the diamonds are there. If you stripped a bit, if you dulled it in any way, chuck it. That's why we buy the cheap ones because if it costs us 10 cents, whoop de doo throw it in the garbage, right? And get another one out rather than break your stone. Um, stones are cheap too. The world is made of rock, right? But the, but the thing is... Uh, the time it takes. It's going to take about a minute to drill and you're popping the backs out or breaking stones 25% of the time. You're wasting your time, you're wasting material you could sell, um, plus you waste your drill bit. So, um, as you drill that pressure, when you get 75% of the way through, whether your bit is sharp or, or you know, half used, half kind of dull, you want to just lay off on the pressure you're putting on there because when you get thinner and thinner stone, you're more susceptible to snapping the bottom out. So uh, we call it blowout out the back when a crater forms. Um, and it's practically inevitable. It's always going to happen. The only way you can avoid it is ultrasonic drilling. Um, and that's not really affordable for people, right? You're looking at minimum a grand at least to get into that. Um, probably more, 1,500 by the time you buy all your setup for it. So again, with our drill press here for under 100 bucks, you're drilling with all kinds of different size drill bits, right? And the ultrasonic drills, can the ones you buy for that price range can really only do holes up to two millimeters in size. Anything above that, you can't do. So 
with this rig, you can do any size hole from, you know, bangles for bracelets all the way up, uh, all the way down to the little tiny pendant holes. So, um, so for that blowout, all you got to do is just use less and less force and make sure your cutting action is the way you exit the stone. Um, and you'll reduce the blowout out the bat. If you have a transparent or translucent stone, you can flip the stone over and you can usually see where your drill was coming towards the surface and you can try and line it up and pierce from the other side. That'll prevent blowout um, as you drill from both directions. When it's an opaque stone like the Jasper I've got in here, our best thing to do is just drill and again, re uh, relieve the pressure near the end. So let me, uh, let me start drilling here and we'll see how it works out. I hold the, uh, the stone uh, with my hand. Again, I showed you before, I can put my hand all over the drill bit when it's spinning and it's not going to hurt me. Uh, the drill bits will never break and fly away, even if it breaks in the stone. Um, I've drilled 2,000 holes in stones and I've never had a drill bit fly out of the pan. I've never had a piece of stone fly out of the pan. There's something called a drill bit to workpiece ratio. Again, when you're working with uh, drill bits in wood, those are all um, twisted drill bits and they have the, the option of catching your workpiece and the wood can spin. Uh, same with metal, metal can catch and spin, but the diamond bits are very different. They can't really grab the workpiece and spin it. If you're using a bit this big on a stone, pretty much the same size, then you're gonna uh, create that problem where it could catch and spin it but it's never gonna spin out of the tray, it's never gonna fly away, it's just gonna grab and the stone will start spinning in place and it might hit your knuckle in a little weird way or, or push your finger out of the way really quickly. It won't hurt you. Um, don't make me have to get a lawyer or anything, but, for the, but I never wear safety glasses when I drill. I should recommend to you to wear them, but know that I don't. Um, Never, I would, this is one thing I would never do, never wear rings, never wear gloves, never wear anything, loose clothing that can catch on a drill press. So um, I don't even use the nitrile or the latex gloves, I just drill barehanded because again, the drill bit can't hurt you and it's just water and stone. You're not drilling in oil or anything like that. So um, hold the stone firmly uh, with your hands, grip it tight, um, especially when you start drilling. As you start drilling the entry point, you want to come down very soft, very casually, almost to create like a, like what a center punch would do. Um, not necessarily a pilot hole, but you want to create a, a crater that will guide the drill bit the rest of the way in. Otherwise, you get something called surface walking. Whether it's a big bit or a small bit, it can uh, skate around on the surface. The thin ones, the very thin bits, uh, will slip out and they'll create big rings on on your piece, so that's just uh, something we want to avoid here. Um, so just go very light touch at the beginning, so you'll feel the abrasive action, and just let it kind of create a, uh, like I said, a bit of a center punch hole, pilot kind of channeling, and once you know it's there, then you can start putting more pressure on. Um, I've had some people that were in a real hurry, literally just wear their bits out so much that the bits flare because they're going too fast. It's gonna take a minute, even though the stones uh, well, you got here like a four millimeter stone thickness. It's still going to take a minute, so know that it takes that time. Um, and you just casually go in and out. I'm going to go up and down, up and down, um, so that I can flush the hole and lubricate it. Uh, so as you see here, I've got about three, maybe even four millimeters of water above the surface of the stone. So now let's just drill it. Do you want to come around the other end? Would that help? So we're spinning. Light touch, right? I can hear the abrasive action. I can see dust entering the water. Those are indicators for me. And so now that I've got a little tiny, you can see a little divot in there uh, where the pen is worn away. So now I'm gonna start really drilling into it. I've drilled a lot of rocks. I can tell by the torque that even though the motor's giant, this drill bit's small, I can tell by the torque how, how much grip is happening on the drill bit, whether I need to flush the hole out. Um, the amount of dust tells me how sharp my bit is, how deep I'm cutting, because I know how much dust should come out with how much pressure I'm putting. The sound, if there's weird sounds, those are all indicators. 
Think of it like three three seconds in the hole before you need to flush it, you know? One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. Light is good, light is your friend, so I've got a lamp right in behind me here. I can tell by the depth of my drill bit, so now I know I'm about three quarters of the way into the stone. I'm gonna start backing off a bit. And I'm just gonna let it cut through, not press through. And like I said at the beginning of the video, you can, move, you can move the stone if you want to, just to get the dust out of the way, you can realign it. Sometimes I blow across the surface of the water, and that'll push the dust out of the way. Um, you're gonna know when you make it through. You're gonna feel a negative space in the back when that blowout happens, the drill bit's gonna pop through. There we go, it just happened. It's like an orgasm. When you get there, you know it. There's gonna be a space where all of a sudden, and I'm through already, but this is gonna drop ever, ever so much, and that's how you know you're through. So, I've got a hole in there. Let me show you what I was talking about with uh, the luster change on the surface of the blowout. Um, this one's very minor, because again, I cut my way through the hole. Let's see if Mike can get that on the film. Can you see the crater in there? So I'll do a close up with the camera later. Um, but if you've got a dull bit, and again, the bigger the bit is, the bigger those craters can sometimes be. You can, you can uh, snap your stone. There's other things you wanna be aware of. Don't drill on a crack, right? Uh, you've got a compromised area of the stone and it's just gonna split the stone, right? Every time you drill into rock, you're still putting force there, even if you're cutting. So imagine driving a wedge into something that's cracked. It's gonna split it, right? Um, there's a lot of stress, a lot of vibration with a hole this small to a stone that big, the stone can handle it. But as you get bigger holes and you get closer to the edges, um, if you're trying to side drill, things like that, you're just creating a lot of stress on the stone and all the chances of, of things breaking um, increase. Yeah? Yes. All right, so now we're going to use a core drill. I think we're up at probably nine millimeters right now into the same stone. So I'm gonna drill the back end of it. So this this drill bit, it's big. It's gonna wanna skate across the surface unless I do that light touch at the start just to create a kind of ring there. And I can hear. You can hear the difference based on the amount of pressure I put on there. Now this stone is very flat. If I drill something that's uh, that's rounded on the bottom, my workpiece, my stone is gonna, gonna wanna move around. If that happens, I'm gonna have to change the placement of the stone underneath the drill bit. Um, especially if I go back to something like a small bit like this, it might start bending the bit if it's, if it's not aligned properly and not running true straight down. So just be aware of that. You can relieve the, uh, the tension and just let it center itself, right? It's not gonna grab the stone. Um, so I can literally leave this pressed against the rock and take my hands off. In fact, I'll do that. And it's not gonna grab it and throw it anywhere, right? So, I can tell the uh, Jacob's truck is riding down the bit because I didn't tighten it enough. So let me just do that. You can see the, uh, the ring forming here. This is what I mean by kind of a center starting point. So now my drill bit will always guide itself in there. Um, always be cautious though when you realign your bit. If you take the stone out and have to realign it, if you're off by a bit, it's going to be a problem. You're going to have that previous evidence of the previous ring and then you're gonna have another one beside it so this is why if you're doing cabs or other lapidary work you want to drill first because any mistakes you can just abrade out as you continue on your project so let's keep going through this one and this stone will have a bigger crater jasper has a conchoidal fraction it's going to want to blow out a big crater out the back just like napping arrowheads tell because there's very little dust based on the amount of pressure I'm putting that this bit is dull. 
there should be a lot more dust. Right? I'm adding more and more pressure. I don't want to break my stone, but there should be more dust. So rather than uh, break the stone and be embarrassed in my video, I'm going to swap it out. This drill bit is probably still good for softer stones, but this is a very hard jasper. These, uh, what do you call them? Not picture jasper, but these glassy-ish jaspers are, are tough on bits. So let's see what I got here. So I don't have another one that size in the back of the shop with me. Uh, so we're gonna just do another hole right beside it with a seven millimeter. And again, a big, something I learned a long time ago is rather than try and force a dull bit through the stone, you gotta switch it out. So it may seem like I'm uh, bowing out early or something like that, but honestly, I can keep going with this hole, but I'm betting you it'll snap the stone. And I've learned that from just you just can't put a, a dull bit through a stone. If there's no abrasive action, all you're going to do is break the stone. So I'll drill on, on the end here and we'll work this stone a lot faster. See how much more dust is coming out of there? Don't worry about the high pitch squeal, that's just friction. With bigger bits, you want to come out of that hole faster. Maybe uh, one and a half seconds, two seconds, but not three. A lot of you might be wondering when I go from small bit to big bit, how fast this motor should spin or how many RPM it should be. I'll answer that. There we go. So that's your uh, little orgasm point where you know you're through. So because the bit was nice and sharp, we have a nice clean hole right there. Let me dry it. I'll show you the uh, conchoidal fracturing around the outside. Again, small bit means less of it, but you can see the luster difference in the uh, crater around the edge there. You catching that? Yeah? Okay. So. Uh, to show you the, sometimes the little core will fall out the bottom afterwards, but here's where everything I taught you comes into play. So there we go. It fell out on its own, but if it did not, I would have the, uh, pokey welding rod and I would poke that out. Um, keep these. They're great for inlay because they are machined round, right? I used a seven millimeter bit. I corded out my kerf was maybe a millimeter on each side. So my core here is probably about five millimeters, give or take, right? Um, we can drill something with a four millimeter bit and practically plug this directly into it. We might have to core, like bore it out or ream it out to, to get it exact, but we know that one is at least perfectly round. So keep those um, and you can plug them in later on. Uh, so, so I mentioned about the RPMs here, how fast it should spin. Set your drill press on the highest setting possible and, uh, and then you become the variable. So, uh, with small, there's, there's stuff online about if it's a big drill bit, you have to slow it down, right? Slow the RPMs down. Don't worry about that. That really only means for bangles, like giant holes. Even if you're doing something that's probably, I'd say anything up to 35 millimeter, just put it on the fastest setting possible. And how you do it is just less pressure and less time in the hole, right? Coming in and out so you can lubricate faster. Um, because again, you're the variable. One reason why I like the drill press is you're honing directly down. When you start using things like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, flex shafts like Fordham's, uh, Dremel's, there's additional variables in that. Whereas your hand is wobbling, you're basically freehanding everything. And again, you can buy the Dremel stand, but by the time you spend money on the Dremel, the stand, all that, you basically end up with just a more expensive, lesser value tool. It's flimsy, those stands are plastic, right? Um, but if you're freehanding it, you're gonna end up with oval holes, like uh, I think it, maybe it's oblong is the word, because you're gonna put too much stress on one end or the other. That's also how you dull or break bits. 
Um, what else do I need to add to the video, Mike? I don't know. I see you modified your uh, drill press. You only have two on this. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. So I took a handle out so that it wasn't bashing against the end of the tray here, right? When it would come down, it would catch on the tray. So I always have to make sure I was drilling way over here, something like that, so that it would miss. And um, it just, it was easier just to get rid of the handle. 